key thing to work. I think you need to have work cool. Complements the sum of two angles is 90 degrees. Supplements, supplementary angles. Sum of two angles is 180 degrees. Now, if we're in the land of radians, instead of 90, pi over two. Instead of 180, it's pi radians. So pi over three. And I know you could probably visualize that, especially since we made our unit circle. If this is pi over three right here, then we're just missing pi over six, because that would be 60 and you'd be missing 30 degrees. 30 degrees is pi over six away, because 30 is pi over six, 30 is one six. That's perfectly fine, because what you're doing is you're converting this and saying, all right, I know this is 60 degrees. So the complement of 60, is 30 degrees, and I know 30 is pi over six, so the complement is pi over six. But that's not learning how to speak the language. That's not living the language. If you're going to truly speak a foreign language, you're not going to spend time hearing every word, translating it into English to understand it. You're going to be able to understand it as it's spoken. You're not going to spend every little moment thinking about what you want to say in English, trying to translate it into the foreign language, and then trying to say it. You want to be able to converse, you know, with your own thoughts in that language. You want to be able to think and speak in that language to be able to truly speak the language. You want to be able to speak radiance. So you want to think about the connection between the pi over threes and the pi over sixes, the pi over fours, pi over twos, and on, so on and so forth. If it's divided by, if it has a six in it, you know, pi over, pi over six, five pi over six, seven pi over six, 11 pi over six, okay? That's a tiny little wedge from the x-axis. If it's pi over three, okay? Those are bigger wedges. The pi over threes are up here. Two pi over three, four pi over three, five pi over three. The quarters, pi over four, half waves. This is just fractions. But the way you would do this, you know you need 90, so pi over two minus pi over three. That's how you would figure it out if it was in degrees. If you had degrees, if you were given an angle of 52 degrees and you want to know what the complement was, so you would go 90 degrees minus 52 degrees to figure out 52 and what make 90. What is the difference between? So that would be 38 degrees. 52 and 38, those are the complementary angles. You would subtract from 90 what you have. So the common denominator is going to be a six. So three over three makes this three pi. Oops. Three pi over six. Multiply this by two over two. And this is two pi over six. Three over six, three pi over six minus two pi over six leaves one pi over six. And that's my complement. And then for the supplement, so now you're looking at what does this need to be? 
to make pi radians. Well, if this is one third, then that must be the other part of it, two thirds, make a full pi. You just got to think in terms of it's got to make a full pi. If I have one of the thirds, I need two more thirds to make a full pi. Or pi minus what you have. The common denominator is going to be a three. So you got to multiply this one pi by three over three. So this is three pi over three minus one pi over three. Three pi take away one pi leaves two pi over three. And there's your supplement. Now, here's where if possible comes in. Two pi over three. Is it less than or greater than pi over two? It's bigger. Two thirds is bigger than a half. So if it's bigger than pi over two, this has no complement. There's no positive angle that you can add to two pi over three and get pi over two. Because, and I, I didn't include this in the definition, the sum of two and they should be positive angles. You can't have one be a negative. So two positive angles that add up to 90, two positive angles that add up to pi over two. Well, there's no way to go backwards from two pi over three, but you still could go to 180, you still could go to pi, so therefore, the supplement would just be one more pi over three. Okay. What do you think? And then what about this one? It's past quadrant three. It's like it, it's it's not in quadrant three, it's not in quadrant four. Three pi over two is on the y-axis this way. That's called a quadrantal. Angle, a quadrantal. When it's on an axis, when the terminal side is on one of the axes, it's a quadrantal, quadrantal angle. It's not in quadrant three, it's not in quadrant four, it's right on the axis. So exactly zero, quadrantal. Exactly 90, quadrantal. But we call it a right angle. Exactly 180, quadrantal. But we call that a straight angle. 270, 3 pi over 2. Okay, that's that. Okay. And then still going. 93, 119. I got tired of you know flipping back and forth and figuring out what the homework was. Okay. So 93, 95. Find the radian measure of the central angle, find theta of the circle, given the radius that has the intercepted arc. People literally. And I don't know if I, maybe I should just stop doing this. Keep telling what other people do, and I don't know if I just make that, oh, this is what you should do. No. Find the radian measure. So we want a radian measure. I mean, oh, radians is angles. And radian measure. Central angle. The central angle of a circle. That has a radius r and an arc length s. An angle, a radius, and oh, the arc length. Arc length s is equal to r times theta when you're dealing with radians. If theta is in radians, if theta is in radians, that's the formula, that's the equation. Okay, you're told that the radius is 15 and the arc length is 8. 8 equals 15 times theta. Solve for theta. Right, 
35. 35 equals 14.5 times theta. Solve for theta. You also know the first thing that we didn't even start with S equals R theta. We started with the definition of theta in radians is how many times can the radius go evenly or go into the length of an arc? That was where we started by defining what a radian was. An angle measured in radians is the measure of the length of the arc divided by the radius. Well, then that makes it even simpler if I use this one. If I use this formula, the arc length is eight and the radius is 15 or 35 and the radius is 14.5. And I plug straight into that. But on your test, you don't get to have formulas. You don't get to have notes. On your quiz, you can have whatever you want out. Test, it's U, pencil, straight edge, calculator, that's it. You don't even get scratch paper. Because I'm not going to grade what you write on scratch paper. If you know this one, you will automatically know this one. But you don't need to memorize a whole bunch of stuff. I don't want you to memorize anything. I want you to know one thing really well and use that one thing and it will just take you everywhere you need to go. Okay. The next set, 9799. Find the length of the arc. So now they want you to find S. Find the length of the arc on a circle of radius R intersected by a central angle theta. Well, here definitely S is equal to R times theta. But remember, this is only if theta is in radius. So number 97, 14, theta is in radians. 14 times 5. But 99, that's not radians. So there is another formula. Arc length is just a fraction of the circumference. Anytime you have an arc, it's just a fraction, 120 degrees would just be the fraction of the circle circumference. So if it's 120 degrees, that would be 120 degrees out of 360 degrees. That's one third of the circle. That's one third of the circumference. So you could, if you wanted to, if you're in degrees, Arc length is equal to theta in degrees divided by 360 degrees. That gives you the fraction. And then of the circumference times 2 pi r. There's the circumference. And you use that. Or you could always convert 120 into radians and use this formula. 120. 120 out of 180. That's two thirds of 108. So 120 is 2 pi over 3 in radians. It's two thirds of a half circle. So if you want to convert theta into radians, then you can just use this. But you cannot plug degrees into here. You cannot do that. Nor can you plug radians into this one. And now they want you to find the radius. So just like I showed you. You know, you have three variables, S, R, and theta. 
on these right here, they're giving you S. Don't let anybody do it. And then they're giving you beta, solve for R. And then 105. Anybody try 105? You're right. Else? A little research. Yeah. Nothing wrong with research. When am I ever going to have to use this? You don't want the answer to that question. Be careful what you ask. Find the distance between the cities. Assume that the earth is a sphere. No, that's not the part we're assuming. It is a sphere. Well, it's as close to a sphere as you're going to possibly get. It's not a perfect sphere, but it is round, it, 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 or, or three-dimensionally round. It's not flat. In case anybody's one of those conspiracy nuts out. Sorry. Conspiracy. Um, if anybody prescribes to some other notion of how the earth is. Anyone? Raise your hand if you think the earth is flat. I have a counselor that is on call. Okay. You never know who's in the room. Oh, I'm sorry. I think my fingers are present. I assume the radius is 4,000. In other words, we're making it a nice number. And the cities are on the same longitude line. Longitude is north-south. Latitude is left to right. Okay. One city is due north of the other. So that explains what they just, you know, just described. One is due north, straight north. Okay, not like straight, the tangent would be in space, but oh, curvature of the earth towards, towards the north pole. I don't mean to over explain, but I want to. Find the distance between them. That would be our equator. And here's the radius 4,000 miles. Dallas, Texas. Is located 32 degrees, 47 minutes, 39 seconds north of the equator. That's what those three numbers represent. Okay, it's north of the equator. So 32 degrees. So if this is like an xy axis, a 32 degree angle would put it right about here somewhere. So right here is Dallas, Texas. And this angle right here. I just said was 32 degrees, 47 minutes, 39 seconds. Omaha, Nebraska, due north. 
is at 41 degrees, 15 minutes, 50 seconds. So right about here, just short of 45. Here's Omaha, Nebraska. And this angle right here from the equator, we have 41 degrees, 15 minutes. And 50 seconds. So here's Omaha, Nebraska. And here is Dallas, Texas. Find the distance between the two cities. Find the distance between the two cities. So they want to know what is the distance here? In other words, what's that arc length? What is that arc length of that circle? So, yeah, I do a nice three dimensional piece, but we don't need 3D. We just need this. Simplify the problem. We're looking at here, center of the earth. Dallas. Omaha. Distance in between. Arc length. Now, it's given in degrees, so we're going to find the measure of the angle. We need theta in between. That arc length S is equal to theta in degrees divided by 360 degrees times 2 pi r. So theta in between. But how do I get the angle in between those two cities? Exactly. We subtract. This total angle, 41 degrees, 15 minutes, 15 seconds. And you're going to subtract the one that's smaller, 32 degrees, 47 minutes, and 39 seconds to find the difference that's in between the two. Okay. I can't take nine from zero, so I'm going to borrow. That's a four. This is ten. Ten minus nine is one. Four minus three is one. That's eleven seconds there. You can't take seven from five, so I got to borrow from the tens place. So I borrow from the you know the ten in the in the second place. So that's now zero in the tenth place, and this is fifteen. Fifteen minus seven gives me eight. Sorry. The minutes. And I can't take four from zero minutes or from the, the 40 from the zero in the ten. So I'm going to borrow a whole degree. I borrow that one whole degree. One whole degree turns into 60 total minutes. So now I have a six in this tenth place in my minutes category. My minutes call. Six minus four, 28 minutes. So when I subtracted 15 minutes minus 47 minutes, it turns out to be 28 minutes in between because I borrowed a degree and turned it in over here. In other words, if I borrow 60 minutes, 60 plus 15 is 75 minutes. 75 minutes minus 47 minutes would be 28 minutes. So now I'm just doing 40 degrees minus 32 degrees, and that's going to be a whole degree. In between the two cities, that central angle is 8 degrees, 28 minutes, 11 seconds. <clears throat> The arc length is eight degrees, 
28 minutes, 11 seconds divided by 360 degrees times two pi. What's the radius? It's the four thousand. So when I do this stuff on the calculator in front of everybody, I try to keep track of all the pieces and I'm gonna round at the end. And that's what I encourage you guys to do. If you round at the, you know, in the middle of the problem, you're gonna lose accuracy. So I always tell students you need to round, be patient, round at the end. So my numerator, Parentheses, eight degrees. So eight, and then I need my degree because I'm, it's it's going to be. Um, I'm plugging. I'm not going to convert it into decimals. I could, but I don't want. To. So eight, and then the degree symbol. Eight degrees, twenty-eight minutes. So then twenty-eight, and then the minutes, which is back in under the angles, and that's the second option. And then 11 seconds, so 11. And then again, seconds is here where plus is. And to activate the green second symbol, you need to hit alpha. <clears throat> alpha plus 11 seconds. That's all in parentheses. And then I'm going to divide by 360 degrees. Now, technically, not going to matter that if I put the degree or not, but that's I'm just going to stay consistent. So that front fraction is. Zero point zero two three five two seven zero zero six two times two times pi times four thousand. So that's going to be eight thousand pi. If this were a test or a quiz, I will tell you in the problem what to round to. You know, the book doesn't do a great job of explaining what you're going to round to. You wouldn't know unless you looked in the back. But I will always tell you in the question what you're going to round to. So I'm going to wait, or actually, I'm just going to go times 8,000. So I just hit times the last answer in my calculator. So I'm not using rounded values. I'm going to actually use the thing that came out from my last calculation, all of it, and do the rest of the calculation, and that will give me the most accurate uh, answer that I'm going to round. Instead, if you round too early and just use 0 0.02, it's not going to be close or even the same as doing what I'm doing. So that answer times 8,000. Times five. So times five. Enter. And those two cities should be five hundred ninety one point two nine eight one five eight. And I would probably on this one ask you to round to the nearest tenth of a mile because most of cars are going to round your, your odometers nearest tenth of a mile. So the nearest tenth of a mile would be right here. So that two is going to get rounded up to a three. So S would equal 591.3 miles. Make sure you put units in your answer. Now, if I shortcutted it, and let's just say I went 0 0.02 right here instead of the whole digits, all the digits, times 
8,000 times pi, and she uh, accurate. So this comes out to uh, that 502 instead of 591. That's way off. Point zero two, point zero two times eight thousand pi. That's the same thing, right? That yeah, is way off. Almost a hundred miles off. Oh, they ran it to the nearest hundred, five hundred ninety-one point three two. But how would I know what I was supposed to round to unless I looked at the answer to begin with? Well, dollars don't tell me to the nearest hundred of a mile. I will tell you in the whole in the test and paper. Okay, so now. 107, 109, 107, 109, 111, 113, 115. So, so I'm not going to do 107. I'll talk you through it. It's the same as 105. Here's what they do. Earth is a sphere, but they change it to kilometers. So the radius is kilometers and feet. What is the difference in latitude of Syracuse and Annapolis, Maryland? So they want to know what theta is. They tell you what the radius of the Earth is in kilometers. And they tell you that Syracuse is 450 kilometers north of Annapolis. They tell you the arc length. So you're given the radius and you're given the arc length. You're supposed to figure out the angle in between. Plug in what you have, solve for what you don't. Okay. Well, nine. Mechanical engineering, an electric hoist is used to lift a piece of equipment two feet. The diameter of the drum on the hoist is 10 inches in the figure. Find the number of degrees through which the drum must rotate. Okay, let's do 109. 109. So this rotates, this rotates and it's going to lift this girder up two feet in the air. In order to lift the girder up two feet in the air, it's got to wrap the chain around the girder, a total of two feet of chain. Two feet of chain get wrapped around that drum then that means two feet of chain that was here are now going to be, because it disappears and it's wrapped around the drum, that's why it's been lifted up off the ground two feet. 
you have to wrap two feet of chain around the drum. You want to lift it up eight feet, you got to wrap eight feet of the chain or the rope or whatever it is, wrap that around the drum, okay? However high you want to lift it up, that's how much rope you have to wrap around the drum. The diameter is 10 inches. So what we want is we want the arc length to equal two feet. There's the drum. We want this thing to go around and so we can wrap two feet of rope around it. We want two feet of rope to go around that thing. But the diameter is 10. That means from here to here is 10. And so the number of degrees, so helium degrees, not radians. Arc length is data in degrees out of 360 degrees, two pi r. Now, here's the nice thing. Circumference is two times pi times the radius. Well, circumference is then move the pi. Two times the radius times the pi. What is two times the radius in a circle equal? The diameter. The radius and a radius, two of them together, 2r is the diameter. So the circumference is just pi times the diameter or the diameter times pi. So you don't have to you know, cut the 10 in half, you're just going to end up back at 10. How many degrees do we need this theta to equal to get this? Okay, now here's the mistake. Two feet equals theta in degrees at 360 degrees times this is 10 pi. That's my mistake. Okay, what? Well, I didn't put any units after 10 because that's my mistake. That's not, but I'm trying to see if you can figure out what it is. Uh, yes, 2 times r, but I just said I can change 2r into just d, and d is 10. So I'm just using this. That's right. So, 2R is equal to D and D is 10 inches. What's my problem? The units are not agreeing with it. It matters. And the thing that students will do is when you start plugging things into the formula, you're just going to plug in a 2, you're just going to plug into a 10, and you're going to look at the back of the book and it's not right. And you're going to go, well, how? If it was metric, you would be off, you know, technically you would be off decimal points because uh, or, or the decimal point would be in the wrong place because it's all about, you know, multiplying by 10. But because feet and, and, and inches are not, you know, if you have a conversion number, It'll be just a wrong answer. You either convert everything into feet or you convert everything into inches. So what's easier to write feet as inches or write those inches as a fraction of feet? Yeah, how many feet is, or how many inches is two feet? That's 24 inches. So this will be. 24 inches theta in degrees out of 360 degrees times 10 inches times pi. Now when you, because you're going to divide both sides by 10 inches, 10 inches, the inches are going to cancel out. You don't have inches anymore when you're trying to find the angle. So I'm going to simplify before I do anything. 24 equals 10 goes into 360, leaving 36. So this is 
pi times theta over 36. Pi theta over 36. And since it's being divided by 36, because you're trying to figure out what theta equals, divided by 36, you're going to multiply both sides by 36. And since theta is being multiplied by pi, you divide both sides by pi. Thirty-six times twenty-four divided by five. So this is 864 over pi degrees. And so that comes out to 275 point. I bet they're going to round to 100, I would think. I don't know. Before I guess, I'm going to write it in about 7417 degrees. And then I'll go peak to make sure my units are. Um, no, I'm by point zero two. Here's hundred. So we want to round up to two hundred seventy five point zero two degrees. That's how many degrees we've grown that rope. To get two feet of that rope up to move it, whatever it is, the felt that zero two. You get to choose now number 111, satellite in a circular orbit, blah, 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 or number 113, mechanical engineering, a motorcycle wheel with a diameter of 19.5 inches and rotates at blah, 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 blah. Pick one. Okay. Motorcycle week. Motorcycle wheel, there's a picture. 19.5 inch diameter rotates. So it's rotating 1050 RPM revolutions every minute. Diameter is 19.5 inches. Two questions. Find the angular speed in radians per minute. And then two, the linear speed. In inches per minute. You're given the biggest hint of them all. 
the units. The units are exactly what you use to figure out the question to answer the question. It's just like the problems we did at the beginning of the semester when we were setting up light speed, how long it took light to get to here and all those other things. You want your final answer to be for part A. I want my final answer to be in radians every minute. Radians per minute means radians over minutes. And yeah, you can put rad over m, min. What do I use to get there? The only thing I can use to get there, first of all, the length has nothing to do with the angle. Linear speed is going to involve the, the, the diameter. So don't pay attention to the diameter just yet. RPMs. You know that this wheel is spinning 1,050 revolutions every minute. This is what you're starting with. This is where you want to end up. So you just need to get your, your units revolutions every minute to convert into radians every minute. Now, the good news is you want minutes in the denominator. You've got minutes in the denominator. You don't have to fix the denominator. You just got to convert revolutions into radians. If you got to convert that. You got revolutions in the numerator. You don't want revolutions anyway. You know, you have to tell the Beatles, no. You say you want a revolution? No, I'm sorry, you don't want a revolution? We're out. Not a single Beatle thing, Richard. You got to really do so. You don't want a revolution, so you got to divide by revolution. You want radians, so that means you got to multiply by radians. Radians are going to have to be in the numerator. So now you just got to think converting radians and revolution. How many radians are in a revolution? Two pi. Two pi radians every revolution. 360 degrees is two pi radians. So there's two pi radians every one revolution. You know those values, not just that you have a measure, memory, you've seen them one day before. You should know 360 degrees, one full revolution, two high radians. So now the revolution reduces in the numerator, two times 1050 is 2100 times pi. You have radians. And in the denominator, minutes times one is just radians per minute. 2,100 pi radians every minute. That's our angular speed. I don't know if they convert to a decimal at all. I would probably guess it's a double. Yep, 2,100 pi radians per minute. So then part B, linear speed. So for the linear speed, I'm going to move this up. So I we want the answer in inches per minute. And this is all we have to start with. Linear speed is basically if that tire is rotating like this, 1050 RPM, then what is the speed of a point way out here on the tire? How fast is it moving in inches per minute around the tire? Did you see the movie Ant Man? When he felt when he was in the apartment, he first put on the suit. He fell out of the bathtub and he went through the floor cracks and he went downstairs. There was, for some reason, in the middle of the day, there's a party going on. They have a DJ going on. There's a 
Because the guy's been on the record and he lands on the record. And it's going around so fast that he follows, you know, he's spinning up. Well, when you're on a record and it's, you know, spinning, even though you're spinning at the same rate, no matter where you are, 1,050 RPM. If it's an LP at 33 and a third revolution per minute, if it's a little one, it's 45 RPM. But you're spinning 33 and a third revolutions every minute. Here's the thing. If you're towards the center, you're just going like this, 33 and a third. And you're, you're really no big deal. You might be dizzy, you might be sick, but you can hang out there. The further you move out the radius of the circle, you are now moving faster than the person who is sitting here because you are covering a farther distance, a greater distance around the circle in the same amount of time that that person is. Your speed is distance divided by time. At this point, you both got at that point the same time. You got here from here to here at the same time, but the person out toward the edge of the record traveled a greater distance in the same time as that person. So the person out at the edge of the record is moving faster than the person towards the center of the record, even though they're going at the same revolution per minute. So the further you go out towards the edge, the faster you're going and the harder it is to hang off, which is why when you go to the fair and you go on that little barf machine that spins around, if it goes around fast enough, it pins you up against the wall. But if you can move to the center, you wouldn't be, you have to be thrown up against the wall. You might throw up, but you're not going to be thrown up against the wall. That's why when you go around a loop in a roller coaster, you stay in the car because you're going fast enough and the radius of the loop is big enough to keep you pinned to the car as you go around the loop. Okay. So the radius matters. This all we want to know is what's the total distance basically every minute. Well, it's making one circumference every minute. What do we got? We got it. this is our angle every minute. And you know, when you think about it. It's going to be our point per minute. Since we have radians, the arc length is r times theta. So this would be. 19.5 times 2,105 radian is going to be my arc length. Now, the arc length is going to be in inches. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Yes. Radius, radius, radius. that is the diameter. That's the diameter, not the radius. Mm -hmm. The radius is 19.5 divided by two. So that is 9.75 inches. I will be got it wrong. I will be got it wrong. What the heck did I put out? The book must be wrong. That's what people are. So that's my total distance. Okay. That's my total distance in radians per minute. That gives me my, this is, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Let, me, let, me, let me backtrack. Let me backtrack. Um, I do have to backtrack. I do have to backtrack. Here's what I'm doing. Here's what I'm not doing. 
And I apologize for this because my brain is farting. I made a point of saying, try not to memorize, use the unit, let the units be your puppet. And I'm not even doing that. I just kind of went off on a tangent. I think I got to sit on the roller coaster that time. This is going to give me the distance it's going to travel. Okay. But in only one revolution. This is not the revolution. This is how fast we're going. This is going to be important, but not yet. So let's, let's take it through. Okay. One revolution is the arc length is going to equal 9.75. And theta for one revolution would be 2 pi. Okay. One revolution would be 2 pi in radius. So in one revolution, you're going to get an arc length of 19.5 pi inches. The linear speed distance divided by time. How far is it going for now? How long? It's going 19.5 pi inches every one revolution. Okay. And it's making 1,050 revolutions every one minute. Revolution reduces. I have inches in the numerator. I have minutes in the denominator. In the numerator, I have 19.5 pi times 1,050. In the denominator, I just have one. Nineteen point five times pi times one thousand. That comes out to be sixty four thousand three hundred twenty four point one zero nine five eight inches every one minute. Sixty-four thousand three hundred twenty-four point one. They round to the nearest tenth. Okay, so think about that. Sixty-four thousand three hundred twenty-four. Point one zero nine five. Inches every minute. My brain does not break that down very well. It doesn't really. You know, so what? Well, that's a lot of inches in a minute. Okay, yeah, it is. But is it faster than a cheetah? 
you know, in a race between this and the Flash and Superman, who I don't know, convert it to miles per hour. If we actually wanted this so we could understand it better in miles over hours. So undo the minutes. We know there are 60 minutes in every one hour. Well, that will get rid of the minutes. Now you have hours down below. Now we've got to convert inches into miles. Well, the way you get there is through feet. Convert inches into feet first. There are 12 inches down below if you want to undo the inches for every one foot. And then you want to divide by feet because you want to undo the feet. And there's 5,280 feet in every one mile. So if we look at the units, the minutes reduce, so all we have left are hours. Inches over inches reduce, feet over feet reduce, and all we have left are miles. So we have 64,324.105098 times the 60 times, that's it, times one times one over one times 12 times 5,280. And that'll be in miles per hour. <clears throat> you know I can't translate words into things. I gotta see it. Oh, I shouldn't have used it. My last answer, second answer. Times and so, and then I'm going to divide by one divide by the whole thing. Parentheses a twelve times five two eight zero. Yeah, yeah sixty miles an hour, sixty point nine. Whenever you know somebody tries to tell me their phone number, I'll ask them, could you start over? The conversion happens. If you know what the units are supposed to be when you are answering the question and you know what units you have when you start the question. You just need to know what unit you need to get. The path that's going to get you there is if I want feet down below, that means I need to be dividing by units and denominator. They're going to take me to feet down below. Okay. If I want hours down below, I'm going to want to, you know, if I want hours down below, well, actually, I if I want feet down below, then I'm going to invert this. I would have needed to have the measurement down below and one hour above. So I started properly. Or if I get my answer, just do it. Because then if I flip this hours per mile, how long does it take? How many hours for every one mile is it? So this question about the Blu-ray player, that thing is spinning at 10,000 revolutions per minute. The last one was only the, the motorcycle 1,050. This is 10 times faster, almost a little, a little bit less. So they want the angular speed, same way we just did it. And then what's the linear speed on the point on the outermost track? Well, we just did that as well. So for 115, you do it just like 113. Um, 117 and 119, those are just true and false. A degree is larger than, a, than one radian. 
one degree is a larger unit than the measure of a radius. If you were to draw a picture of one degree, would it be like really a big opening or a little? No. One radian is approximately how many degrees? Is that you think? About 57. It's 57 of those one degree. So a radian, one radian is bigger than a degree. So that's one. The angle of a triangle can have radian measures of two pi over three, one pi over four, and a pi over 12. Well, the three angles of a triangle have to add up to what? 180. So in radians, they have to add up to? What's 180 in radians? Pi. So do these three add up to pi? Two pi over three plus pi over four plus pi over 12. Common denominator would be a 12. So, so four over four, this is eight pi over 12, three over three, that's three pi over 12, and this is one pi over 12. Eight plus three is 11, 11 plus one, this is 12 pi over 12. These three angles add up to one pi radian, so those could be the three angles of triangle. Radian. That's what I mean by being able to speak whether automatically I can speak in radians or I can speak in degrees. Okay. Um, the, the 127 or 129, I'm not that overly concerned about. I know that everybody's coming from different parts in their last math class. All that I'm really wanting you to, to get an idea of because, and, and here's, here, here's the thing. This is chapter five of the textbook. What is right here is actually covered in chapter one, two, three, four concepts. So if you haven't taken math three, math three A, you might not know, but if you've taken an algebra two class, you at least probably should have seen it. Inside parentheses, when you mess with an x coordinate, you're shifting the graph left and right. When you shift left and right, it's always to mess with the x. You've got to have it in parentheses. If it's not in parentheses, you're not messing with the x. When it's in the parentheses, it's a built-in negative. It's always going to be a minus in it. So if the negative is always built in, the shift that you actually are doing is the opposite sign of what you're looking at. So when I see x minus one, even though you see minus one, the shift was a positive one. It would have gone one to the right. Here's why. It's all about this one. This graph, x cubed, has a, an x and a y intercept at zero. X cubed looks like this. So it goes up like this. And X intercept, Y intercept is right here at the origin, zero, zero. So this graph is going to take that graph and it's going to move it maybe left or right. Well, what minus one? What would X have to be to make X minus one equal zero? It would have to be positive one. So if you plug in positive one, one minus one, I get zero cubed, I get six. When you plug in positive one, it's going to be here. That graph gets shifted to the right one unit. And if you saw this, x plus one to the third, what would make this equal to zero? Negative one plus one. If x was a negative one, then over here, negative one, the graph would look like this. So that graph gets moved this way. But because you see plus, the shift is the opposite sign. If you see plus, it's going to the left. 
If you see minus, it's going to the right. You do the opposite direction, the opposite side. Okay. That's one of the things that is always true. Always true. And then 129, what happened to this beginning x cubed? Well, now it's no longer just x cubed. It's not a minus in front of it. So what happens if you put a negative in front of any graph? It becomes a reflection of what it used to be. Regular positive x cubed is this. This is y equals positive x to the third. If I put a negative in front of it, then these answers that used to be negative y values now have an extra negative in front. So they're going to flip up here. And these positive answers that used to have a positive in front now have this negative in front and they'll flip down here. So anytime you put a negative in front of the function, it's going to flip it across the x axis up and down for reflection. And then you have this extra plus two, like a plus two that happens after the fact. So you take all of these answers, which look like this, and then you take all those y values and then you add two to them. So like right here is zero. I would take zero and then add two to that answer and it would be an appearance. Over here at negative one, you get one, but you're going to add two to it. So it would be up here at three. And what happens is that graph has been shifted up two units. All the last answers were just here. And then everything got lifted and shifted up two. That's what happens. And you see, this is not in parentheses. So I could have written f of x equals negative x cubed plus two. Yeah, there's something messing with the x, but it's not inside the parentheses with the x before the cube. It's after the cube takes place. So after you cube and get the shape, then we add two to it, and that's the verge. Those little nuances of graphing, shifting left to right, moving it up and down, reflecting, those are all going to come into play for the second part of chapter five when we graph the tree functions like A sine D X minus H plus K. Do you see how H is inside the parentheses of X? H moves with left to right. Do you see how the K comes afterwards? After all the other part of the function is done, that's the vertical moves it up and down. The A on the front, well, what happened on the front? That's positive, it's regular going in the regular direction. But if it's negative, it gets flipped upside down. It also controls something else that we'll talk about. And then B in there also controls something else because the you know, has got other things to control. But all the pieces tell a little part. When you graph, you first want to graph a few points and then figure out what the darn thing looks like. And then you start to catch on. I don't need to plot points anymore. I know what it's always going to look like. I just need to know what to look Any other 5.1 questions that I didn't give you some information about that you might want to? Now, the quiz on Monday is just like the warm up I gave you on Monday this week. Okay. Did that come up on the YouTube? The very beginning. I did practice problems and it looked like. Yeah. Oh, I know. It's on my very neat and tiny desktop. No. 
Tell you what, I will, I will post it. I will post it when I send you the YouTube today. In case you didn't. Because I didn't print it out, I just, I put it on the forehead. So now we tackle a little bit of trigonometry uh, jargon from the perspective of geometry. Just to start with, we learn trigonometry at the beginning in geometry only in right triangles, right triangle trigonometry. Eventually that will evolve, but for right now, right triangle trigonometry. So in a right triangle, We have this angle down here at this bottom left hand vertex. We label that our theta. And we have in a right triangle two legs and a hypotenuse. The hypotenuse is always the longest side of a right triangle. The hypotenuse is always opposite the right angle. Now the legs are the two sides that make the right angle. You have an adjacent side and an opposite side. An adjacent leg and opposite leg. The adjacent leg is one of the sides or adjacent side that actually forms the angle theta. So if it's adjacent, that means it actually forms next to adjacent, next to. It forms the angle. Opposite is across from, it's opposite the angle. So if I label this one over here, if I just label this uh, angle P, then this side over here is opposite angle P, and this one is adjacent to angle P. This, no matter what, is always the hypothesis. So what matters is, what angle are you talking about? Where are you standing? Who's opposite, who's adjacent, or where are you? It's all about perspective, point of view. In geometry, you may have heard about Sokotoa. Who's heard of Sokotoa? Anyone? A little bit more than half. So one of the little Mnemonics that people use to remember the trig ratios. And this works for right triangles. It doesn't work all the time, but it works for right triangles. It works for geometry. You have three trig ratios for right now. Three trig ratios the sine of an angle, the cosine of an angle, and the tangent of an angle. Okay. The sine of an angle the cosine of an angle and the tangent of an angle. Now, when we actually write these, sine is going to be abbreviated S-I-N, cosine is C-O-S, tangent would be T-A. The sine of an angle is uh, defined as the sine of this angle theta is the opposite side
divided by the length of the hypotenuse. It's the length of the opposite side divided by the length of the hypotenuse. So that's kind of important, this real quick step right here. The length of the opposite side, maybe that's given in feet. The hypotenuse would also be given in feet. So if you're taking the sine of an angle and you have you know, eight feet divided by 10 feet, then sine of theta has no units. Because if you put feet over feet, the feet are going to reduce. You have no units, it's just a number. The sine of an angle in a triangle is just a number, it's a ratio. Okay, so there's no feet, there's no you know, meters, there's no centimeters, there's no degrees, there's no radians. When you take the actual sine, cosine, or tangent, it's a ratio of length over length. The length units cancel out. You have no units as your final answer. So sine is opposite of what I thought. The cosine of the angle, the cosine of theta, is the adjacent length, the sine adjacent, that length, divided by the hypotenuse. The adjacent of hypotenuse. And the tangent of an angle So the tangent of this angle theta is the length of the opposite side ratio, the opposite length divided by or over the adjacent side. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. Tangent is opposite over adjacent. And that's where Sokotoa comes in. Sokotoa, sine, is the opposite side over the hypotenuse. Cosine, C, cosine is the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. And then tangent P is the opposite side over the adjacent side. So the total. Now, there. Using the lengths of these three sides, you can form six ratios. Six? I don't know. You can form six ratios that define the six trigonometric functions of the acute angle theta sine, cosine, tangent, and then you got these. Ones. So there's three more. So you've met Sokotoa. So Vitoa is one of the most famous American Indians of all time. He met his cousin Choshakao. Choshakao, well, he doesn't get talk, to, talk about it enough. It's because he's not in the geometry curriculum. But Choshakao is going to turn your world upside down because that's what he did to Sokotoa. It's the reciprocal of these trig functions. The reciprocal of the trig ratios, sine, cosine, and tangent, is the other three. These are just reciprocal. So sine and cosecant, sine and cosecant, they are reciprocal ratios. Cosine and secant are reciprocal ratios. Tangent with cotangent are reciprocal ratios. Okay, how do I remember which one is which? Okay. If you don't have a co, then your reciprocal has a co. If you don't have a co, there's no co here. The reciprocal is the one that does have a co, the cosecant. 
So psi and cosecant are the reciprocals. They go with each other. You go with a co. Cosine, that has a co. So its reciprocal is the one that doesn't have a co. It's the one, the only one that doesn't is secant. And then, okay, hard to mess up the tangent. Tangent with cotangent, though, so that one you'll be able to put the next. But which one with which? Sine with cosecant. Sine, no co. Cosecant, you got a co. Co, go with co. No, sorry, no co goes with co. No co goes with co. Those are how you increase it. Or let's just do first. Sine of theta, you've got opposite over hypotenuse. Now, cosecant is CSC, cosecant. You have C, the S, and the C. It's the reciprocal of sine. So, cosecant theta is going to be hypotenuse over opposite. <clears throat> the cosine of theta is adjacent over the hypotenuse. So the reciprocal of cosine is just secant theta. So secant theta is the abbreviation. The secant of theta is the reciprocal, the hypotenuse over the adjacent. And then tangent. So theta is opposite over the adjacent. So the cotangent, COT, the cotangent of theta is just reciprocal, the adjacent side over the opposite. The cotangent. So if the TOA gives you sine, cosine, and tangent, <clears throat> sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. Tangent is opposite over adjacent. Cho sha cow. Cho sha cow. So cho sha cow. Sine's reciprocal is cosecant. Cosecant starts with a C. Cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. So it would be hypotenuse over opposite. So the reciprocal of cosine is secant. So it starts with an S. Secant. It's the reciprocal of the cosine. So instead of adjacent over hypotenuse, it's going to be hypotenuse over adjacent. Cho sha. And then the reciprocal of tangent is cotangent, C. And the reciprocal, instead of tangent being opposite over adjacent, is going to be adjacent over opposite, Cha. Cho sha ka. Cosecant is the hypotenuse over the opposite. Secant. 
is the hypotenuse over the adjacent. So tangent is the adjacent or the opposite. What are the questions when we get to the 5 2 place? Does this kind of build up? If you know one of them, you know all six. If I tell you one of those, you're going to know all of them. Something like this. And a right triangle. Um, the cosine of theta is equal to here, 24 over 25. And then it would say find the exact value of all six triggeration. So on a quiz and or test, over here on the side, it's going to say this. What's the sine of theta? What's the cosine of theta? What's the tangent of theta? And then right across from it so you can see who goes with what. What's the cosecant of theta? What's the secant of theta? And then what's the cotangent of theta? There are certain times where I write down a place for you to write the final answer because if I didn't, I'd be looking all over that piece of paper for where your answer is. And you might like, oh, my answer is five over nine. But five over nine is what part of the question? Is it the sine? Is it the cosine? Is it the secant? Which one is? I don't know. You're not labeling. You just go five over nine. There's six answers to this thing. Which one of those is that? I, this way, over here, if I have this typed in on your test, you just got to fill in the blanks. Show your work over here, fill in the blanks. If I know one of them, I know all of them. First of all, if you know one of them, write it down. You're going to get marked off if you don't. Oh, 24. You don't know how many people did leave that blank. As you know, that one. You know this one, 25 over 24. Hey, two out of six ain't bad. Well, I kind of Because you know all of them. Here's how you get the rest, and it will be a lot easier once we get going. I'm telling you right now, draw a freaking picture. I don't know how much it's going to save your butts. I'll be saying no, I won't be saying like that the rest of the semester, but I will be that frustrated sometimes because oh you just draw a picture. Right angle. Maywood, right angle, theta, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So this is 24, that's 25. Now if I want sine or tangent, I need the opposite side. It's a right triangle. Right triangle means Pythagorean theorem. So I just labeled this with, now I, I get a little funny with it. Since it's vertical, I'm going to call it y. 24 squared plus y squared equals 25 squared. So 24 squared is 584 plus y squared. No, 10. 576 plus y squared equals 625. Subtract 576 from both sides. Y squared is equal to 49. Take the square root. And the missing side is a 7. So now the sine opposite over hypotenuse. 
So the cosecant must be 25 over 7. The tangent would be opposite over adjacent. And the cotangent would be 0.4. Okay. If you know one, you know them all. All right. We are missing two. Roger and Justin Ha. Justin Ha. Pablo. Yeah. Marcelino. Yeah. Red. Yeah. Lipsy. Yeah. Brennan. Yeah. Daniela. Yeah. Isaiah. Yeah. Candice. Yeah. And Chris and us. That's it. Make sure you finish five point one, and I will send an extra practice for the quiz. It's not mandatory. It's not a thing you have to do, but it's a warm up that we'll start class with on Monday. Monday. Okay.